I would like to welcome you. My name is Mary Norman, and I'm your workshop mon monitor today. So, <laughs> first of all, I want to ensure that you get your CEUs for those of you that have C that's going to be receiving CEUs by having me sign your CEU uh, slip at the end of the workshop because you need that in order to get credit. We also have workshop evaluations. If you have not received them, I can give you those evaluations so you can uh, evaluate the workshop and turn it in for today. You have one sheet for today and one sheet for tomorrow. Okay, our presenters today is Sally Weaver. Ms. Weaver is the director of the Jewish Community Programs at the Jewish Family Service of Los Angeles. She oversees a program that targets sp specific uh, challenges, challenging needs of the Jewish community. She is the founder of the Rabbi Social Workers Roundtable. She has authored several articles of the Jewish family and on multidisciplinary co collaboration. She is a professor of a pastoral counseling at the Hebrew Union College Rabbinical school. School. Rabbinical school. Sorry. It's okay. And our co-presenter is Rabbi Ronald Stern, a member of the clergy staff of Stephen S. Wise Temple in Los Angeles. He is responsible for implementing two aspects of the temple's five-part vision: social justice and community and community which includes working with the interface institutions and clergy throughout Los Angeles, promoting advocacy and community involvement and environmental and communicable concerns. Rabbi Stern serves on the executive committee of the Southern California Board of Rabbis and the I mean, Inter-Religious Affairs Council and Energy Independence Committee of the American Jewish Committee. Thank you. Enjoy your workshop. <laughs> okay, so we normally would be sitting around a table with you, um, but we'll be standing up here. Um, but that, that does not mean that we don't want to interact with you. So um, we encourage questions. And um, I guess what, what I want to start with is that I, well, I guess what I want, really want to start with is how many of you are members of the clergy? And how many of you are mental health professionals? And how many of you are other? Okay. <laughs> so since, since the program we're talking about is an interdisciplinary program, I'm, I'm especially happy you know, that we have a really nice mix today. Uh, the program we're going to be talking about is the Rabbi Social Worker Roundtable, and this is a program that grew out of a collaboration between Jewish Family Service and congregational rabbis in the community. Um, for rabbi, w you can just substitute clergy because we really do see this as a replicable, replicable program you know, within a variety of faith communities. And the the, the background of the program is that as the director of the Sectarian Office of Jewish Family Service, which is otherwise a non-sectarian agency, um, one of my jobs is establishing relationships with the synagogues, with the clergy, and finding a way to build a more collaborative base between our agency staff and our social workers and synagogues uh, and, and their clergy members. I also, as was mentioned, teach in the rabbinical school at Hebrew Union College. I teach pastoral counseling. And through that experience and all of the work that I've done with the rabbinic community, have been very, very aware of the fact that as social workers, we get a lot of opportunity to consult on issues the clients bring to us. Um, all I have to do is walk out of my office, turn right, turn right, you know, be in my colleague's office, and I have someone I can sit and talk to. Very, very different for rabbis. And what I was hearing increasingly 
from rabbis who had you know, been in pulpits for a period of time was those lucky students, you know, they get to spend a year with you, uh, but here I am in a congregation with 500, 800, you know, 1,000 families, and all kinds of pastoral issues are coming to me, and I've had no training at all. Why isn't there something for us? So that was certainly an impetus to look at how we might be able to use the resources and the talents of our social work staff to provide consultation for rabbis. I had an additional agenda that social workers, sort of tr especially Jewish social workers, but you can dispute that with me because you know, this may be an issue in other faith communities also, um, don't, because Judaism is both a culture as well as a religion, they may not identify with the religious part. And we were just talking a few minutes ago about how the whole issue of spirituality is really challenging within Judaism. So I wanted to help bring our social workers into an environment where they would have the opportunity to meet rabbis up close and personal, to start looking at the nexus of, of spirituality and counseling and understand more about you know, how spirituality might inform their work and to learn a little bit more about what the tradition has to offer. Not necessarily religion, though that obviously is a piece of it, but also the broader issues of spirituality. <laughs> and my agency's interest was that we wanted to build more of a collaborative base between the agency and rabbis. And, the, you know, and one of the things that we had learned is that if the rabbis and the social workers don't know each other, if a social worker calls a rabbi and says, I have this great program on how to take the keys away from your aging parent, you know, can we do it at your synagogue? The rabbi is not likely to respond if it's not a name he knows or, you know, a, a face he can remember. So there was enormous potential, you know, for bringing t these two groups together. Um, the roundtable has been meeting for about five years. As with many other groups, it's had a lifespan. Uh, it, it's been enormously successful, and it's probably at the end of its life cycle now. This is a group of started with six congregational rabbis and six Jewish family service social workers that met every month from 8.30 to 10 in the morning um, for about four and a half years, and then started meeting quarterly, and then it was clear that that, that everyone had gotten an enormous amount out of it and that it was time to sort of you know, move on to other venues. Um, we have four of our founding rabbis and I think probably four of our founding social workers who continue to be part of the group. We have other rabbis who have come in um, and you know, stayed for a period, maybe moved on to other pulpits, um, you know, had changes in their job descriptions, similarly with social workers, but that there's always been the original core and always a group of at least 12 meeting around the table. One of the things that Rabbi Stern and I are interested in at this point is exploring the possibility of an interfaith roundtable. So at the end of this presentation, uh, if any of you are interested in being part of that exploration, definitely give us your cards and we'll talk about it more. So, sorry, we're... Um readjusting to a new presentation format. We had a uh, boardroom setting in the other room, so we're going to be jockeying at each other for we'll just elbow each other out of the way. Um, and we do invite your questions. Uh, part of the reason that we like the boardroom setting is that people felt comfortable raising hands and asking questions. So I want to extend that invitation to you again, despite the setting of the room. Um, a little bit about rabbis as, a, uh, as clergy, and I imagine that there are plenty of parallels with other clergy people. I'm in an unusual setting in my congregation. It's, it's a particularly large congregation. And there are four rabbis doing what we call pulpit work um, and two other clergy people, cantors, uh, who do the musical pulpit work. So we have a setting where we do actually have a, uh, opportunities for a certain level of consultation with each other. Having said that, the nature of our pastoral consultation is generally, have I got a story for you? Um, here's the situation that came up that I'm really just either frustrated with or I don't know where to go forward or it's just a good story and I want to share it with you. It's not a formal setting that social workers are much more comfortable and familiar with where regular sessions occur with uh, either someone who is um, a consultant who we can bring case studies to, explore how we've handled the situation, and reflect on how we are 
pastoral counselors in particular settings that we find ourselves. I, for, throughout my rabbinic career and at the very beginning especially, felt that deficit and actually sought out a professional therapist for me to use as a consultant. The congregation paid for me to go to this therapist and bring my pastoral situations to him and for him to provide me with insights into the dynamics that were going on in the particular setting. But that's missing in rabbinic work. So what the, past, the rabbis, uh, social workers roundtable afforded um, uh, rabbis was this opportunity to sit with people who are professionals and counselors from another discipline. We're not trained through rabbinical school to be necessarily counselors. There are very few rabbis who are um, identified as pastoral counselors. They may have some experience. They may have a year of Sally's class. They may have done some what we call CPE work, clinical pastoral educational work in the summer. But none of, very few of us have a degree in counseling. When we get that degree, more often than not, the place that we're doing counseling is not the synagogue. Um, we may decide that we're out of the rabbinate and we do our counseling outside of a synagogue. So generally the framework in which a congregant comes to a rabbi for pastoral counseling would be three sessions. Um, and there are challenges that come with that. We're going to explore some of the challenges of what it means to be a rabbi in a congregation and also to be a counselor for congregants. But I'll hold back on that as we move forward. So there were a few considerations um, that, that went into forming the round table. Um, the first uh, was uh, actually from Rabbi Ed Feinstein, who's my rabbi, that if you want to form relationships with rabbis, you need to do it before it's a crisis. Um, I think I was talking to him during a crisis saying, rabbis aren't answering my phone call. He said, do you have a relationship with them? Like, no. Uh, so important to start building a trusting relationship so that when you need each other, you know, you make the call, you know who's on the other end of the line. You need to create environments where there's trust building between the clergy and mental health professionals. And we'll, we'll talk in some detail about how we went about it in this environment. Um, there's a need to help rabbis understand the language of clinical work, the language of mental health, um, to understand what the issues are so that when they see them, they recognize them. And when they're talking to consultants, they know the language to use and the language they're hearing. And similarly, there is a need for social workers and mental health workers to understand clergy issues and clergy language and the language of faith and the language of tradition and the language of spirituality because, again, that's going to be the foundation of the way that we relate to each other. And it's the nature of Judaism in particular that many people identify culturally as Jews, they may not identify spiritually as Jews. And that would certainly extend to those who are involved as social workers. Ask them if they're Jewish, absolutely. Ask them the last time they went to synagogue, they may not remember. Um, but they still consider themselves connected and committed to the Jewish community. So they're not, social workers are not necessarily familiar with rabbis as someone who you could pick up the phone and speak to or someone who you sit around at a dinner, ta dinner table and speak to. Or if they are, the rabbi that they're familiar with is their rabbi in their congregation, not a rabbi who will sit down uh, and have a conversation about my challenges in pastoral work or my challenges with a client or a member of the congregation in pastoral work. That's an unfamiliar setting for social workers to be in. It's an unfamiliar conversation for rabbis to have with social workers because we're used to going it alone. Really, for the most part, we're used to being in settings where people come to us. We're expected to be the both authority figure and the one who possesses particular skills or knowledge that would allow them to solve their problem. Um, it's, it's an astounding reality of the rabbinate to me that someone is ordained as a rabbi on June 15th. They pack their bags, they go to their congregation, and they move into their new op office on July 1st. And on July 30th, there's a congregant in front of their office, who, in their office with the door closed, who's talking about her divorce and the challenges of her children and the challenges of her ex-spouse or her soon-to-be ex-spouse and financial. And this young rabbi of all of 28, 27 is supposed to be an expert in the field. And he's supposed to be able to bring, or she is supposed to be able to bring, a wealth of knowledge that draws from his or her experience the rabbinical school. Well, that doesn't exist. So if we could, ideally, every rabbi, before, as he or she is out there in the field doing his or her work, they would have a social worker who would be their partner, or they would have a round table where they could bring challenges, questions, issues, conversations to, uh, about the work they're doing. 
Um, so there's a profound need, and it doesn't just extend to the new guys. I've been a rabbi for 18 years. We started our rabbi social worker roundtable in my then 14th year of the rabbinate, 13th year. Completely worthwhile. They had a lot, had brought a lot to my understanding of the work that I do. Um, now, having said that, doesn't mean rabbis will attend. One of our big challenges is that rabbis are busy. They're the CEOs, they're the CFOs, they're the, the programmers, they're the religious school teachers, they're the religious school directors, perhaps, of a congregation. Again, fortunately, in a large congregation like mine, we can all be more or less um, specialized in our different responsibilities. In a smaller congregation, it doesn't work that way. Um, so the challenge for us, and I, again, I imagine this is a similar challenge for other clergy, is how do we get the clergy person to attend this event and to commit to several years of participation? Um, because it often was, was at least three months as a I start. Ask, but we figured if they came for three months, they'd stay. They'd be hooked, yeah. right. And, and, and some people didn't get hooked, and some people actually um, came in, said, this is, this is going way too slowly for me. I, I need answers to my questions. And we had all been together for two years, and we were much more comfortable with the process. Um, there's a need to teach rabbis what they don't know, because some of us don't even know what we don't know. We think that it's enough to provide um, insights from the tradition, and that will, on some level, help a person go through their process. Um, we think that it's enough to perform the ritual, some of us do, of a wedding or a, of a, a funeral officiation or of uh, bar bat mitzvah, and that the process itself is all that we do. And what our, our experiences in the rabbi's uh, social workers roundtable have taught all of the participants is no, no. We are counselors throughout the process. The extent to which we want to engage in counseling as the process is going on may or may not be. You know, that's a question. But we are certainly, as we're involved in life cycle events, just because they don't present to us as a family with issues or needs, or they haven't come to us and said, we want to have a dialogue about this issue in our family life, doesn't mean that when we're officiating at a funeral, we're not counseling a family with dynamic issues that exist in the family. Um, Sally spoke about the need to create a connection between rabbis and social workers for us to know each other. Um, I've reached a place, Sally and I have been working together now for five years, where when I have a question, I have a social worker that I can call, and that social worker can also send me to others and help me when I need to refer people out to other settings for therapy. Um, a piece for rabbis that was an agenda item for us, which is hugely important, is for us to teach social workers that religion has a place in counseling um, and how, how, how they can use religion, not necessarily their religious preconceptions or their religious issues, but how they can use conversations about God, conversations about ritual, conversations about um, family structure in as much as they reflect the religious context in their own work as, as therapists. And that, I think, for the social workers was the most eye-opening experience for them. As the rabbi said, we would, we would naively, or I, innocently, I should say is a better way to put it, look at a therapist and say, and, and as they're talking about some situation, and say, well, did you, did, you, did you ask them about their understanding of God? And the therapist would say, well, that's not my job. You know, I don't want to get into that because I'm not an expert. And our conversation would then evolve into one where we would, uh, we would they wouldn't walk out of there as an expert, but we were the perceived expert, expert so we had something to add to the conversation. And so, so social workers then generated a knowledge about how religion could enter into their conversations with their clients. Yeah. We had MFTs uh, and a psychologist as, as part of the, quote, social work staff. I just, it's too long to say social workers, therapists, okay. MFTs. No, I right. Was there, was there but, thank you for asking that. Thank you for asking that. Yeah, so, because, uh, so, I mean, just as rabbi, you know, I want you to hear as clergy, social worker, I want you to hear as therapist, mental health professional. Many of our, our social work participants actually were program directors. I mean, they were, they were LCSWs or MFTs or PhD, um, not necessarily in clinical roles, but supervising clinicians. And because the agency's interest was building collaboration, we felt these were the people who, first of all, brought a, you know, a, a certain level of expertise, but also could make things happen within the agency. 
um, but yes, every, everyone is included. Social work with small s, small w. Yes. Oh. Okay. Um, so, as I mentioned, the, the roundtable met monthly. I want to tell you a little about the format, uh, which was a format that evolved. And as soon as it evolved, uh, it, it was very clear that this was exactly what was needed. We started by having presentations on various topics that we thought, you know, that, that the group actually suggested would be helpful and important. Countertransference, depression, um, crisis counseling skills, et cetera. And often the, the social worker would do a presentation and we would ask a rabbi to come prepared with some vignettes from his or her own practice that tied into that and then have a discussion. The other thing that we built in was burning issues. And burning issues meant that if you were counseling someone or there you know, been a, a counseling situation in your practice, whether it was you know, clergy you know, or the social work staff, that you could bring that up and there would be instant consultation. Um, that became the primary format over the years of the round table, that we would start with a burning issue and address that burning issue and it would lead to larger issues and larger questions. Um, and often, I mean probably more often than not, it was the rabbis who were bringing the burning issues. And I think one reason for that, as I mentioned, is that social workers have other places to consult, uh, whereas rabbis typically don't. And the other thing, and the social workers were just, I mean, blown away by this, the, the severity of issues that are brought to rabbis, um, yeah. and, and I'm, because they're not, uh, it, it's just overwhelming, the, 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 the seriousness of the issues, whether it's addiction or mental illness, um, you know, family breakup, uh, I, I mean, just enormous issues, enormous issues. I do burning issues with my students at the rabbinical school, and they all in turn, they have pulpits. They've had murders, they've had murder-suicides, things that, I mean, often social workers, you can go a whole career without seeing that. So a burning issue is often really a burning issue. And for the rabbis, they're going right back into the involvement um, around these issues with their congregants. Yes? Yes, exactly. And what happened is we sort of got, after like a couple of years, we got rid of the presentations. Because if we started with what's a burning issue, an hour and a half later, it, you know, we were still talking about where the, where the burning issue led us. Uh, and it was a very, I think it was a very, very helpful format. Um, it was clearly very important for the rabbis um, because they really, really used it and they, and they brought really challenging issues. And it, it gave the social workers an opportunity, you know, to do not only a lot of consulting, but to start really understanding both the kinds of issues that people brought to their clergy, I mean, the profundity of those issues, and to explore, like, what's different about being a rabbi? And, and we'll, we'll get into what some of the differences are, but that you have such a different take on this, and it's actually enlightening as a social worker to, to hear about how you're working with that. Uh, one of the first times a, a rabbi um, during burning issues made a suggestion, I mean, based on her own experience about a ritual that she would use with this particular client. I mean, one of the social workers was just, she said, that's so amazing. I can't even imagine going to my own rabbi and, and, and having this discussion, you know, let alone, you know, being able to engage in a ritual that might have real meaning to me. Uh, and I mean, it was one of those breakthrough moments for the social work staff of, of beginning to put together how we're all healers on the same journey with people um, and have so much to bring. I'm sorry if I missed it, but what was the frequency that you were working? Monthly. Okay. Yeah, so it was, uh, yeah, 8.30 to 10 seemed to be the best time at a location that everybody could get to. Oh, golly, what worked? Uh, yeah, the, the challenge. Friday's not a good day for rabbis. Other than that, we were, we were fine. Yeah, I, every three months, I would send out, I, I used Meeting Wizard, and I would send out 15 dates for the following three months, and whenever the most people could come, um, that's how we would choose our dates. What we For a while, we always met on Thursdays, and then some of the rabbis started having days off on Thursday. So we found scheduling um, three months at a time was really the most effective. You have to be very flexible with this because 
clergy time. I mean, there are also there are funerals. I mean, there's, it's very, very challenging. I want to talk about one of the most significant distinctions that we discovered about ourselves. I think we all knew it into, well, I, I mean, clergy knew it about themselves and social workers knew it about themselves intuitively, but what we didn't realize is how much it impacted the therapeutic relationships that we have with our clients. And, and that really has to do with boundaries. Um, a social worker's boundaries end at the door for all intents and purposes. When that client walks out the door, that client is no longer a part of the social worker's life. And, and, and Sally likes to tell the story of being with her kids. I'm going to steal your story. Go ahead. <laughs> of being with her kids at a grocery store. And um, a client will walk up to her, and Sally will not introduce the client to, the, to the, her kids. And her kids say, oh, that was a client, wasn't, wasn't it? And how do you know? Because he didn't tell us her name. Um, well, it doesn't work that way for rabbis. If I don't say hello to a congregant in a grocery store, then I hear later that I ignored that congregant. Um, and I, when, so when I have somebody in my office who's just spilled the intricacies of their personal life and their husband who's having an affair and who has violated the trust she has in him and the children, what the children know and the rage she has for her husband and on and on and on, I then will be sitting at the same table with that couple at the social event that follows uh, that weekend. Or I'll be um, teaching him in a session that I run if they happen to be particularly involved families, or I'll be doing services, and I, my sermon might be about something that I know, oh, this is going to resonate with that family. Uh oh, I wonder how they're going to take this topic. So, so the boundaries for a rabbi are, are strange, and clergy person, are strange at best, challenging uh, often at worst. A, another area where that becomes particularly relevant is the extent to which we help people. Um, again, a therapist is comfortable saying, I can give you a referral or I can give you a phone number, or let me give you a list of agencies where you can go for this particular situation. A rabbi is expected to, in cases of a death, appear at the home. And in fact, people will tell stories about how the rabbi came to our home every week for the seven days of mourning. And that rabbi was so wonderful, and they, as the congregant is telling me this, what I'm thinking to myself is, is this what they expect of me? Because they're not going to get that. Because, because our tradition at our congregation is not to do seven days, because if we did, we'd never get out of houses, um, because we're a large congregation. Um, so, so visiting a person in the hospital, um, people bec pr begin to think that they have a particularly intimate relationship with the rabbi, because that rabbi was at the hospital, then officiated at the bar mitzvah, and then, and people will often invite me to a bar mitzvah party. And why aren't you coming to my party, rabbi? And I have to come up with an, a reason that makes sense. And the answer is because if I come to a party with my wife, I know the details of this family's personal life. I've gotten to know them. They're complete and total strangers to her, especially in a large congregation. So boundaries for a clergy are particularly daunting. And the, the, the idea that we just have a therapeutic environment where we work is, of course, um, it's incomprehensible to, th to clergy. And the social workers, though, were able to challenge us about the perceptions of what those boundaries were, how to help us define boundaries better, and, and how to be conscious of when we violate, consciously violate, and what the implications are of doing that, and why we would or wouldn't want to do that. So that was an example where we kind of worked with each other, and they would look at us and they'd go, wow, <laughs> that's really tough to have to do that. And, and even just saying that to us sometimes helped us realize what it was to be involved in that situation, but their acknowledgement of the challenges was very, for us, therapeutic, to say the least, believe it or not. Um, 
Well, there's, I mean, people come to rabbis and to therapists for different reasons. So w one of the sort of guidelines that, that we offer, actually that Howard Kleinbell offers um, through, I mean, his books on pastoral counseling, is that clergy should really not see a congregant around a counseling issue more than three times. Um, because if it's more than three times, it's probably therapy, and you should be making a referral. And referral doesn't mean you're abandoning your congregant. It means that you maintain the pastoral, you know, clerical role, but that the psychotherapeutic role is, is transferred to, you know, s someone with the expertise in that area. I have a slightly different question. I'm not sure. Oh, okay. Uh, just, uh, we're d we represent different organizations yeah. that have actually... I was there, but I, okay. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Go that actually have so... <laughs> so um, <laughs> what we learned in the last session is that there are some churches that actually have counseling centers in the church. Um, and synagogues. Right, and, and then they would have a social worker. It just so happens that the, the, the structure of the group that we represented, the social workers have their office, they do their thing separately from us, and we're all rabbis from different congregations. In fact, I misspoke at the last session where I said, um, we're all not actually in the same agency, and all the social workers, it turns out, are in the same agency, but the rabbis all represent different congregations. Right. And so we don't have that kind of relationship with the social workers where they're actually in our facility. Is, is that what you, you meant? Okay, all right. Because actually, I mean, so you were answering the, in, the in-house counseling right. question and also actually just mentioned that rabbis are all over, right. so okay. therefore there's training that trains the whole body and just does one organization. Absolutely, yeah, and, and, and that was very much the intention, that, that we wanted to reach as many rabbis as we could because we felt this training was imperative. Um, and the opportunity for them was imperative because that, cause the rabbis had already told us that. Um, and also, as I said, that we wanted to develop a collaborative relationship. Um, I mean, another piece of it, though, is that I if rabbis were seeing congregants where they realized that th they needed you know, f further assistance, our hope, and, and this often this started happening, was that they would refer them to Jewish Family Service because now they knew the social workers. I mean, that was another challenge that, I mean, rabbis don't want to refer to a faceless clinic. Um, they have therapists in their congregation, they have therapists they work with, and Jewish Family Service, because of just, the, I mean, the enormous size and scope of it, has a faceless quality. So the tendency was that if rabbis made referrals to us, they would think, well, I can refer seniors, because they have lots of you know, senior things, and if someone is mentally ill, um, you know, standing in my office mentally ill, I'll refer them. Um, and it was partly because they didn't quite know to do with someone who was mentally ill, um, and didn't understand that there were other reasons that they could refer clients to Jewish Family Service. So that was something that grew out of it. The issue of referring clients to rabbis was the other side because social workers had never, my social workers, never thought about that. I mean, that actually was, was another one of the really moving sessions where, where one of the social workers just said, because a, a rabbi said, well, you know, we're ta you keep talking about us making referrals to you. Why don't you make referrals to us? She said, well, why would we refer someone to you? We're like, <laughs> okay, let's talk about that. <laughs> yes. It, it, well, it's, it's actually a basic tenet of pastoral counseling, and, and I do refer you to Howard Kleinbell's, Kleinbell's book on, on pastoral counseling, uh, which is, I mean, he's sort of the patriarch of this field. But the, the reasoning behind it is that three sessions gives you the opportunity to assess what the issues are that are being brought to you. Uh, and sometimes you can tell in the first session if these are issues that you're going to be able to deal with or not. Um, to have the opportunity to have a first session to talk about how a congregant, I mean, what, like what the issues are, you know, if, if, if it's something simple. Um, you know, my, I'm having a really hard time parenting my child um, and I can't seem to make time for my husband. 
um, and he's been really upset about it. So if that's the issue, a rabbi can deal with that. Uh, if it's there's no spiritual life in my home because my husband gets home too late for me to light candles on Friday night and, and to, for us to have a Sabbath dinner together, I mean, that's something a rabbi can deal with. If it's, you know, he's, he, as, as the conversation unfolds, you know, he's really critical of me as a parent and he doesn't get home in time on Friday night and he's staying later and later at work and I think he's involved with somebody and actually we've been having a lot of fights and he hit me last week you know, then you know you're dealing with something else. Uh, and it, I mean, it doesn't have to be that extreme, but as the story unfolds, y y you will have a, what I call a pink flag, as opposed to a red flag that says, this might be something where it's appropriate for me to be making a referral. So what I need to assess is, how can I be of support as a rabbi, as a clergy person, to this person? Um, and should I be considering a referral for the counseling part of this to another professional, and how am I gonna make that referral? So it's really a, pro a process of assessing what can be accomplished in three sessions, and if it can't be accomplished in three sessions, th that's your indicator um, that you probably need to make a referral. While also talking about, look, you know, I'm your rabbi. I'm going to stay involved with you. You know, I'm going to follow up with you, um, but I don't have the skills and expertise to work, you know, with you on some of the issues you've brought to me. And part of my job, you know, part of the expertise I do have is knowing how to refer you to the right person. Mm -hmm. I would really like to meet with a rabbi. If I had somebody who was involved in their religion, I would be able to help them with that. So we're going to talk a little bit later about interfaith aspects of this. Um, because the... They haven't I, yet. We haven't yet. Yeah. So your roundtables are... Not only is it Jewish, rabbi. but it's also, it's also representatives of the liberal movements of the Jewish community which already changes the dialogue. There's a, in fact, there's a separate division or department right. of Jewish Family Services which deals with Orthodox Jewry. So we were a relatively homogenous group, and actually one of the questions that we present to this group is, how do we engage in dialogue across religious, not denominations, but across religions? So let me talk about how we put this together because it begins to, to lay the, the, the groundwork for answering that question. Um, first of all, the, the balance of the group is really important, and we made the decision that this was not going to be an open invitation, um, that it was by invitation only. And the reason it was by invitation only is that there were certain qualities that we needed and certain attitudes that we needed to make a group like this work. If it was going to be built on trust, we needed people who had a capacity uh, to and a, willing, a, a willingness to be learners and not come in as experts. Um, actually, there was a social worker who wanted to be part of the group who, I mean, I finally said, oh, you know, everyone coming is a beginner, you know, and you're so experienced, because I knew this is someone who would just come in and, you know, be the expert in the group. We, we needed an environment where everyone was an expert um, and where there wasn't a hierarchy. Um, we needed people who would be patient with the process, uh, who would understand that this wasn't about fixing, um, you know, walking out with, oh, yeah, I know exactly what I'm going to do, I just got this skill set, but to really engage in the process, who would make a commitment to attend, uh, that this was not a drop-in group. So we did ask uh, for the first go-around that people commit to three times. And I would have asked for three years, but that didn't seem realistic. And the truth is that I, I think without exception from the first group, everyone who came stayed. Uh, and again, of, of, of the six who came the first time, four of them are still part of the group. Uh, we had definite rules about what it meant to participate. One is that you had to talk. Um, you couldn't just come and listen and walk out and say, oh, I learned so much, that the whole purpose of this was to be an active, engaged member of the group. Um, that was sometimes a real challenge, not with the rabbis, but with the social workers. Uh, part of that is that the social workers were still sort of intimidated by sitting in the, at the same table with rabbis, and social workers sometimes have a lot of difficulty. I'm, I'm going to generalize here, but it certainly fits my population, my community, um, feeling like they're authorities 
with religious figures. Um, one of the great things that came out of this is that the social workers learned that they were really valued by the rabbis, and that shouldn't have been a shock, but it was. And whenever a rabbi said, we can't tell you, you know, how important it's been, you know, for us to be able to sit with you and learn from you, th they would call me and say, I can't believe a rabbi really said that. Uh, so this was an important part of the growth process. Um, people had to be willing to challenge language, which also meant they had to be willing to have their own language challenged. So rabbis had to be willing to say to social workers, you know, that's psychobabble. Um, I don't know what those words mean, you know, talk in English. And we were more polite than that, though. <laughs> no, actually. <laughs> Not that I recall. <laughs> you had to have a sense of humor. You absolutely had to have a sense of humor. Um, and social workers had to risk revealing that there were things they didn't know about their own religion and say, I don't know what that word means. I don't know what that ritual is. I, one of the social workers, uh, th actually the first time that that happened, one of the social worker was sitting and, and she was listening intently and then she finally said, I have no idea what that ritual is that you're talking about, um, you know, so could you explain it? And I thought, well, you know, good for her. And she came up afterwards, she said, oh, I sat there, I was so scared about saying that out loud, like what was he gonna think of me? But, you know, uh, you know I did it because I, I knew that, you know, you would want me to do that. And then three other social workers came over and said, oh, thank God you asked that question because I had no idea what it was and I was afraid to ask. You know, but it broke the ice because that question was met with respect. And part of balancing the group, choosing you know, both rabbis and social workers who we knew would be willing to engage in this kind of process, wouldn't be intimidated by this kind of process, you know, really, you know, help people take chances. And I, I think every time someone risked exposing themselves about not knowing something, it, it was met with such respect, you know, that, that it just strengthened the foundation. Um, confidentiality, obviously, was a rule that was what was said in the room stayed in the room. Um, my role as the facilitator uh, was not at all as the expert. I mean, it was really to organize it. Um, I was the contact person both for the rabbis who would call and complain that the social workers weren't talking enough or weren't bringing in a, enough of their uh, you know, case vignettes. And then I'd be the nudge with the social workers saying, gosh, you were all so quiet and you know, if you want to be part of this, you really have to be more engaged and so and so, you know, don't, I'm sure that you have an example, you know, from your practice that you could bring and you're assigned to do that next month. So I was always, you know, sort of, I mean, part of, the, of keeping this on track was making sure that everybody got heard and sometimes we would just talk about it in the group. It's like, the, okay. The yes. quality that Sally had, which is critical, is that she wasn't intimidated by rabbis. Um, and, and you know, I know that seems like again. I, I, my family thinks I'm just a person, and so do my friends. But there are people who don't necessarily view clergy with that perspective. And Sally was able to because she's been around rabbis for her <laughs> life, and she teaches rabbis, and she to be able to actually challenge us and and say to us, you know, here's this. We need this from you, or could you do this next time, or things like that. And she, because of her role as the I called her the, the uh, and you can, you can analyze this in all its levels, but the mother of the group. Um, Don't analyze it. <laughs> she, she, you know, she, she could talk to all of us the way we needed to be spoken to, and that was important. That's an important concept. Yeah. I just have a quick question. Are there times when a traditional religious orthodoxy or uh, views are at odds with social work practice, and how do you usually handle that? One of the reasons that Jewish Family Service has a whole separate department called Elenu, uh, which is our Orthodox Counseling Unit, is that there are definitely instances where there are challenges in terms of values. One of the things that we talk about, maybe Ron will talk about that a little more, is the whole issue of, you know, as therapists, what kind of value base do we bring? And do we bring, uh, you know, that as, as liberal Jews, we certainly don't bring a strong religious value base. Within a, a, a fundamentalist, more fundamentalist religious community, um, and, and I mean, I'll, whether it's Orthodox Judaism, you know, or, or forms of Christianity or whatever, there are religious beliefs that are so completely tied into the values of the community 
that to have a therapist who didn't accept those values and those beliefs and those practices um, wouldn't just be problematic, they would have no credibility. So the issue, for instance, about birth control um, could be enormous in the Orthodox community. Um, I mean, having, having a, a, I mean, if a woman came and said, you know, I have 10 children and I don't know what to do, uh, you know, my, like, you know, I, my, my husband wants more children, I just don't know, you know, if, you know if, if my body can stand it, you know, but it's really what God wants of us. You need someone from inside that community to be able to address it. And they work very, in, in that program, they work very closely with the rabbis and they've really been able to to do similar kind of consultation with the Orthodox rabbis as what we do in the round table so that there are rabbis who Orthodox clients, Orthodox rabbis whom Orthodox clients can be referred to, you know, who will be able to be more pastoral in their approaches rather than just saying, you know, this is what the Torah says and this is what you have to do. So it calls for an enormous amount of sensitivity to where these issues are coming from and what's required within a religious community. And, and having said that, I mean, and that certainly defines and characterizes the nature of the Orthodox, nonetheless, we still are, as clergy, carry a certain, a certain um, milieu that comes with us to the, to the encounter. So um, one of those, for example, and this is something that we all actually were challenged by, is our, our role as an ethical guide. Um, and the voice of morality in it. In a, so my story is of a woman sitting in my office whose wedding I had officiated at two or three years ago, and this is the whole idea of longitudinal experience with couples, who was telling me that she's very unsatisfying and that she's very unsatisfied in the marriage, and she's having an affair. So here I am as a rabbi um, encountering um, the fact that this woman is telling me that she's doing something which in my, my ethical standards is inappropriate. So I had to wrestle with how I, t how I both counsel her, acknowledge her pain in the relationship, acknowledge her frustration with a spouse that just doesn't fulfill her needs, and at the same time say the way to solve that, and I think this is actually what I said, I, I said I hope you understand that, ha that violating his trust and having an affair is not solving the problem in your marriage. And we need to explore that together, and we need to talk about that, and we need to, uh, and I, I want you to understand, I don't want you to walk out of my office thinking that because you've shared that you're having an affair with me that somehow or another, and I didn't come down really hard on it, that I, it's okay. Because I felt that I had to say that as a rabbi. I had to present that moral perspective, which is, of course, very different from a social worker. So, uh, uh, is that right? Is that accurate? Very different from, or? Well, except that we might come at that question a different way. Right. Um, and rather, I mean, okay. we still might come out with, you know, what is this doing to your family? What is, you know, what, what is making so, this choice mean as opposed to healthier choices? So, right. So I had to, get, okay. So I had to, get, I felt a need to get to it faster. Yeah. Um, because I knew I wasn't going to see her several times, and I didn't even know if I would see her a second time. Um, just to bring up a couple of other issues that, that we explored in our group and I think are relevant for all clergy. Um, our role is authority figures. That people will often defer to our judgment because it's perceived that, now less so in the liberal movements of Judaism, but even in the liberal movements of Judaism, people will defer to our, um, our perspectives on things because we represent in, in this therapeutic relationship, God's presence, an awareness of the wisdom of the tradition, uh, an, uh, um, uh, an understanding of Torah and the texts and all those things, and that then becomes our moral force, if you will, and our authoritative um, credibility in the relationship that um, complicates it even a level farther. Because they may or may not be willing, the client, to tell us all the things that we need to know to fully understand the situation. That this woman told me she was having an adulterous relationship was actually unusual. I've been in situations where the wife has said this, and then in the course of a conversation with the husband, maybe they were together, he, of course, is not going to acknowledge this. Or I've had to shake his hand and welcome him to the bar mitzvah knowing that he's having an affair with his wife. So they're, so they're having an affair <laughs> with another woman. Um, so th these are kind of challenging situations that we find ourselves in as rabbis, and then also knowing that we represent this presence in the relationship, the therapeutic relationship, that then carries over out of the office into all the other places that we see this, this, this person. And I can't, I, the client is the wrong word. See this congregant okay. is really the word that works best. For the rabbis, no.
responsibilities on the part of your confidentiality yeah. policy applications <coughs> and, uh, uh, and what guidelines to go by as a rabbi in order to protect the client from the point of view that is uh, opening and closing the door right. to you. We have a certain degree of confidentiality. Um, it's not, and this is where I guess a, a, a priest in confession has a whole different level of obligation to the client than a rabbi would in, in conversation in an office. But we do um, certainly have um, a level of, I don't know that it's actually a legal confidentiality, believe it or not, but it is a, we consider it to be a moral yeah, confidentiality. It's great. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's great. So you don't, have, yeah. you don't have to have a certain license for it? We had a session on this, but I forgot. So. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, very, it's very great in terms of, for instance, child abuse reporting about what penitential relationship means. But certainly, in, in terms of the standards of the round table, um, we, we talked about confidentiality. Um, and I mean, th the importance, I mean, in, in fact, rabbis hold an enormous amount. Um, and they have to because then they're in social relationships, you know, where all kinds of things can spill out. So I, I think in general rabbis do hold to that standard. Mm -hmm. You'll see there's an article in um, the booklet that, that you were given um, that we published about the round table and it has a lot of vignettes that were shared at round table discussions and uh, th all of that was vetted through the rabbis that, you know, I tried to, I mean, d disguise the situations. I mean, the rabbis didn't mind th the situations being used, but we worked very hard, you know, to make sure that if anyone read it, they wouldn't say, oh my God, that's me. No, but uh, for me, the confidentiality is within the congregation, and actually, I encounter this almost daily. Um, uh, a congregant who uh, I've had conversations with, and I've gotten a sense, a deeper sense of who she is, wants to be on the board of directors of the congregation. And I know that she's absolutely not qualified, and in fact, will be destructive in a committee or a board of directors. And I have to, how do I tell somebody, a, a professional in our congregation who's not a rabbi, who doesn't have that kind of a relationship, that this person shouldn't serve on that committee, even though they really want to. Yeah. Because I happen to know these things about that person. So that's where the confidential, not with the social workers, because we wouldn't share names and they didn't know the people either. No, that, but really it's with, it's because of the, the, the complex way that we relate to our clients, our congregants, that makes confidentiality both, both an uh, incredible burden, you know, even to the point of coming home and telling my wife, so, so, you know, pillow talk, right? Be spouses, where, who do you talk to? If you can't talk to your spouse about your challenges in your work, um, especially, you know, uh, and, 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 and unburdened on some level, mm -hmm. um, but the challenge is that she might be able to put two and two together and figure out who that is. Yeah. So how do we have that? Some of, the, some of what we learned, you know, early on, um, had to do with, I mean, what we're now talking about, some of the unique differences between um, therapists and clinicians and clergy. Um, one, obviously, is the training. The issue of boundaries includes such things as, you know, that, you know, as, as a clinician, I can say I'll see you, you know, Thursday at 3 o'clock. Uh, and I know that when I'm out at the supermarket or in Loman's dressing room that if I see a client, I'm not going to go over and say, oh, hi, how are you? I mean, that that person can either acknowledge me or not. It, it's, it's their lead. Um, I am not likely to have the experience of walking out to the parking lot after a meeting and having a congregant say, oh, Rabbi, I just want to take a minute of your time. You know, I know it's really late. Uh, you know, I know it's already 1030, but uh, actually my marriage is falling apart. You know, my wife is having an affair and, uh, you know, my kids are flunking out of school, you know, and there you are in the parking lot having to figure out what to do with this pastoral moment uh, <laughs> and how to put boundaries on it so you can both get in the car and go home. That's not unusual. It, more yeah. usual than unusual. More usual than unusual, the informal. I, I, I'll share uh, actually an example from one of my rabbinic students because the, the students, when they go to their pulpits, um, 
often it used to stay at congregants' homes. I mean, they're in places like Juneau and um, I mean, small towns in Montana, Utah. So a, a student had shared with me that he, he was staying with his family. Husband picked him up, and as they're driving, um, the husband said, you know, I know you were planning to stay with us, um, but actually my wife and I decided last night uh, to divorce. Um, and she actually has already moved out, and I still have the kids, and they're hysterical. It probably isn't best for you to stay with us. I'm going to drop you off at a hotel, and you know you can sort of figure out, you know, get a cab or something to come to services tomorrow. You know, but I really need your advice about what to do. So I thought we would just take a long ride now. Uh, I mean, it doesn't happen to social workers, you know. <laughs> so, it, you know, and this was one of the things that was so stunning for the, the social workers in the round table is, I mean, realizing the pressure that clergy are under and, and the lack of boundaries, the lack of, of boundaries in the perception of, of the congregation. Um, the issue of longitudinal relationships, I mean, that, that clergy relationships with their congregants can extend for years and go through all kinds of manifestations um, and can back up on dual relationships. Um, you can have a social relationship with a congregant. How social can it be? Uh, challenging issue with my rabbinic students is to suggest that you can have friends in the congregation, but you, the, a part of you always has to hold back to be aware that these are congregants. And we've had the, situa the discussion in the round table about rabbis who said, you know, I actually I've got really close friends. Uh, it's never been a problem. And then maybe a year later we'll say, remember I told you I've never had problems and I have, I'm really good friends with someone in the congregation. Well, let me tell you what just happened. Uh, and I felt so betrayed. And wh what happened is that the friend had a role in the congregation um, where he exerted some authority that was not friendly. Um, but in his role as a layperson, may be appropriate. But all of a sudden came this awareness that we're not just friends. Um, th there, there's another layer to this. And how do you how do you like navigate this? Um, and how can clinicians help rabbis navigate this and feel okay about setting boundaries? Because p part of it is how do you feel okay about setting boundaries without feeling you know, that you're withholding something. How do you make a referral without people feeling they're being abandoned? And understand the boundaries. Yeah. I, you know, it's not that social workers automatically get the boundaries that clergy have to set because social workers don't live in that world. So it's, it's that social workers actually work with the rabbis to help the rabbis understand the boundaries. And, and again, I, I think that this is probably relevant for all clergy, and this is what's in an interfaith or a Christian or a Muslim or whatever the religions are that sit around the table, there's potential for those, the social workers to actually help the religious functionary um, navigate, understand, and unpack the complexity of, you know, just a, a quick vignette. For me, the personal situation was where our daughters, so congregant, rabbi, Families were, would go away skiing often, and we spend time together, and some holidays and things. The daughters got into it. And as their daughters are in seventh and eighth grade and doing what seventh and eighth graders naturally do to each other, especially, right? Especially when they're girls. And so, um, <laughs> and, and it, it, watching the, now this congregant just exacerbate the problem and turn it into a and we're a large, we're 3,000 families, so turn it into an, an, an experience that involved our, our school and the principal and, and just lit, escalate it to such a level that the relationship between the rabbi and now and the congregant is over, it's gone because of the daughters. Um, and it, it was a very painful experience to go through, but to share that process with the social workers and just have them help, you know, for them to look at me and say, as you're describing this woman, do you understand her, what she's doing and how she's really escalating and how she's bringing so many issues into here. And for me to kind of give my description of the situation, the social workers say, no, it looks like you're handling this okay. It looks like the way you're navigating this is, is, is okay. No, this woman really has issues. You can't heal that. You can't heal her. You can't make this go away. It was hugely valuable for us as we went through the process. Outside, I see it as a very pro 
Well, I think they're, they're L.A. Jews, and then there's everybody else. <laughs> L.A. Jews have, you know, they have a director of the therapist that they go to, so it's a... <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I think there are people who do associate a, st a stigma with, with therapy, but uh, seriously, I mean, I think that in L.A., it really is, maybe California in general, it's, you know, not even considered to be uh, out of out of, you know, out of line to say, yeah, well, I was talking to my therapist last week about X, Y, and Z, and you don't instantly think that the person has major issues that they can't be sitting at the table with you. So, so no, I don't think that there's a tremendous fear or stigma. Perhaps on some level it might be, oh, my rabbi knows I'm seeing a therapist. But I haven't really encountered that. Yeah, uh, yeah Eddie had said that. Yeah, previously. yeah. So I, I think there are a number of reasons um, why people go to their clergy instead of a therapist. And they're For free. It's free. <laughs> no, and yeah, and we laugh, but it's free, and, and that's real. Uh, if you go to your clergy, then it's not, I mean, I think the shame factor that Rabbi Feinstein talked about mm -hmm. is a piece of this. If you go to your clergy, you know, it's not a question of pathology. You know, it's not that something's really wrong with me. I'm just consulting with my rabbi. Um, and rabbis have the choice of playing into that. Um, you know, we're saying, you know what, the kinds of issues I'm seeing here, you really need to see a therapist. So, yeah, I, I, I don't, I, I, I think there's a shame factor about needing help. Yeah. So there's a resistance. I, I, I had a wedding couple where I basically had to say to them, I will not meet with you again until you get yourselves in therapy and have had at least two sessions with the therapist. So it was more that I'm fine, I don't need a therapist than Maybe that was underlying that there might have been some, some resistance, but you know, it, it varies, I guess is the only fair answer. Yeah, yeah and, then, and then Karen, yeah. I mean, it, I, I would think of it as, as maybe like a conduit. You, the, the congregate goes to the, to, the, to the rabbi, to the clergy, to, to, to say, say, I got a problem here, let me see, see the, the rabbi and they'll give me some words so I, I can fix this at home and then their, really, I think, to their real honest surprise, the, 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 the referral to a therapist is coming to it. And then isn't that, I think, that's such a you know, vital role that, that, that the rabbi would play. Is, Absolutely. Is, is they would, someone would, who, who has a good relationship with the rabbi would, would, would get that referral where they would never think of, you know, looking up to a family therapist. Right. Absolutely. Right. And, and making a referral is a skill. I mean, it's, you need to learn how to do that. So it, it's not just, oh, I'm going to give you a name. Kieran. And I think people do come to us first, also because of that whole role of us being the, the, the moral guide that will be able to provide them with affirmation or provide them with some insight. So they may not even think, I need a therapist for this situation. Um, I'm, again, I'm just thinking of a real life scenario of a woman came about parenting advice. Now, I haven't written any books on parenting. 
Um, uh, and that's, I, have, I am a parent, but I haven't written any books. I have helped parents over the years. I have had conversations. I have been to parenting seminars, but I'm certainly not someone who's considered myself a parenting expert. And yet, she came to me saying, you're the rabbi. You must be an expert in parenting. You can give me insights into my situation with my child. So I want to talk for a minute. Oh, is that a question? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And things kind of go south with the creep. Um, could you just maybe address how, uh, what a proactive thing did work for you proactive? You did that by having speech with them, kind of, a, kind of a, a crises or but any suggestions on how to really minimize those types of things? Things are going to happen to kids. It's the nature of the beast. Well, I mean, there. There were different things that might happen. Um, I mean, you referred to a, you know, a CPS report. Uh, I mean, if there's a child abuse report, I mean, the, the truth is we can't minimize that. Um, that sometimes we might send someone to a therapist who determines you know, that, that legally they have to make a report on that. And I think then, then the Im really important role of the rabbi is to be there as support to that family as they go through that process um, without necessarily judging what the therapist did or you know why the therapist had to do that ideally to get permission to talk to the therapist but there are times that we can't protect people um, I mean it's it's sort of aligned with the issue it, it, with something that we deal with in the group what it what it means to be a helper you know when you can't help when you can't fix something and sometimes we work with families where we really can't fix it um, if someone finds themselves, I mean, you've made a referral to a therapist, and, and actually my recommendation always is to refer to a minimum of two, but ideally three therapists, to never just give one therapist. Um, because if you, if you just make a referral to one therapist, you're saying, I know that this is the best person for you. Well, I'll tell you that I know after almost 40 years in the field um, that there's a lot of chemistry in therapy. Um, that a lot of it is skill and training and a lot of it is chemistry and I can't I, I can't predict what the chemistry is going to be I, I can make some good guesses in terms of who I make referrals to but it's not my job to say this is the best therapist for you and uh, and when I make referrals I'll say I'm going to give you three names uh, there you know I recommend all of them uh, make an appointment and you know hopefully it's going <laughs> to feel really good you know, if, if you feel it just the chemistry's wrong, you're the consumer, and you can make an appointment with another therapist. Uh, and that doesn't mean that you should go shopping and shopping and shopping, because then I'm going to say you're really resistant to therapy, mm -hmm. you know, but that, that there are variables in here. So part of uh, not taking responsibility for a bad referral is that you're, you're empowering people, you're giving them a choice. Uh, and, and then you have to be there as a source of support if things don't work out. And I, I think that's really hard because we want to jump in and make it right. I want to bring one more issue up so before yes. we take a question because it's, we're getting close to the end and I just want to talk about God, that's okay. Um, <laughs> be, because it's not an, an, an insignificant issue and what um, we are. <laughs> Last night around 10.30 as we were talking about today's presentation, I said, you know, I don't think we've mentioned God yet. <laughs> Like, uh-oh. <laughs> and, and that was actually our role as clergy. And we're theologians, so we spend our lives exploring different ways of understanding God. Um, and that's what we do, um, in addition to the many other things that we do. F social workers don't do that. Um, they, ha they come in with their own set of preconditions about their own relationship or lack thereof with God, their own relationship or lack thereof with religion, and then we're, we are, on the other hand, are those who do. And now there are two challenges with this. One is we challenge the therapist, as I said earlier, to kind of have that conversation with the clients, to not be afraid to ask the question about God. They challenged us as rabbis to recognize when we're projecting or injecting our own theology into the conversation and assuming 
perhaps that the client or the congregant should have our own theology. So, so right, because we've clearly been thinking about it for a long time, and all of us on some level have reached a certain level of comfort with our understanding of God and the role of God in our lives and what God means. Um, so we then might have a tendency to assume that that's good for everybody. It works for us, it must work for everybody else. And so what the, what the social workers have challenged us to do is to pull back from that, or at least to recognize ways, to come up with ways of saying, let me, let me experiment with you in terms of a view of God. Let me challenge an assumption that you made about God. Um, one of the ways, for example, that I learned from my encounter with the social workers was to say that a person comes and they bring a certain equation, A plus B equals C, and my view of God fits into that equation. How can we ask them in a non-threatening and a non-authoritarian way to maybe think about that equation? Does it follow that I believe in God, God controls everything in the world, therefore God did this to me? Does that necessarily follow? Um, is there another way of thinking about God? And so we, we've learned to bring our knowledge of different theological understandings into our conversations with congregants in a much um, um, more process-oriented way. Social workers have been challenged to not shy away from conversations about God, and they've hopefully learned that they, when they do encounter situations that they don't feel equipped to respond to, they can pick up the phone and call any of us and perhaps get some insights into those situations. So God, God is huge in our conversations. Um, it's certainly a, a topic that for us is, um, is both meaningful and even in the conversation, though we don't pray at the beginning of or at the end of our meetings, I would say that there is a powerful level of spirituality in our conversations that all of us walk out feeling that we've done more than just consult with each other, that in some way we've lifted the quality of our interactions and the work we do. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I want to share two examples about this from the, the social worker side. Um, one was a, a, a social worker who was working with a woman who was a Holocaust survivor uh, who had suffered, I mean, her, her daughter had been diagnosed with cancer, she'd lost a grandchild, I mean, terrible losses. And the social worker was really struggling with that. And then the woman said to her, why is God doing this to me? I, and she, she was just overwhelmed. She said, I, I, like, I can't answer that question. So, you know, so she sort of analyzed it. You know, like, why do you feel that? I mean, she, she, she took a very psychotherapeutic approach to it. And I said, well, what else could you have done with that question? She said, well, she said, I can't answer a question about why God would behave that way. And I said, do you think that's what this woman was asking you? Was she asking you to tell her why God was doing this? She was like, well, uh, maybe not. I said, so what else, what else could she have been asking you? And, and what she finally came to was that she could say to this woman, um, you know, why do you think God would choose to do this? You know, is, is that the God you believe in? Um, Eddie Feinstein talks about default theology. And his example, uh, I mean, it's, it's based on okay, this scenario that woman calls him, has to meet with him immediately. A woman, uh, a congregant, but someone he doesn't know, goes into the waiting room, says, and she's like, I have to meet with you now. So he goes out, he says, hello, I'm Rabbi Feinstein. Uh, and she said, I'm here with only one question. Uh, and I don't want to hear any of your God talk, I don't want to hear, you know, you telling me all this religious stuff, there's a question you have to answer for me. It's like, do you want to come in the office, have a cup of coffee, have a cup of tea? So like, I just want to be clear that you're not going to like force religious stuff on me. He's like, come in, we'll talk, and he's thinking, she came to me, I'm the rabbi. So she sits down, daughter, young children, diagnosed with breast cancer, stage four, the woman said, this is my question, why is God doing this to me? And he said, it's like having the Times New Roman font on your computer, you know, that you might switch to all these other fonts that you like more, and every time you turn it on, it goes back. The default theology is that when people are in a terrible crisis, that people who swear they don't believe, all of a sudden, you know, there's the question, you know, why is God doing this to me? So the, the imperative question, whether it's from clergy, or from social workers, and that was something I think the social workers came to understand, is to say, well, what does that mean to you? You know, is, is this the God you believe in? Uh, and in fact, when the social worker said to the Holocaust survivor, you know, is, is this the God you believe in? Who, you know, do you believe in a God 
you know, who would do this to you? She said, no, I'm an atheist. Uh, <laughs> so, but, but that was the default theology, but you don't know that unless you ask the question. And you can't ask the question if you think you're gonna have to be a theologian when you're only a therapist. So that was one example. The other is um, that in terms of the impact on the social workers, um, uh, during the period of, of uh, Hurricane Katrina, we, we had one of our sessions and one of the social workers said she was just really upset. She wasn't sleeping. She was like feeling so much despair about both what had happened as a result of the hurricane and what was happening with the government and the way people's lives were devastated. And then she felt so in incredibly alone and just didn't know what to do um, to sort of pull herself out of that. And one of the rabbis said, did you think about going to services? And the social worker sort of did a double take and the rabbi said, yeah. she said, you know, you can, she said prayer's nice. She said, but community's also nice. And you might want to go to services and, and be with a community, you know, that's also struggling, you know, with what the meaning of this is. So one of the other rabbis said, actually, I'm speaking about that Friday night. You know, I'm, I'm speaking about where was God in Katrina. And the social worker went and she ended up joining the synagogue. Um, so it was, I mean, it was one of those just exquisite moments where it sort of all came together and really came together in part because of the trusting relationship that had been built over time that the rabbi could say to her, have you thought about going to synagogue? And the social worker didn't feel that as somehow, you know, a, a rabbinic criticism um, that she wasn't a good enough Jew because she hadn't gone to synagogue. So there, there's so many, I mean, important nuances in creating an environment where you can talk about these issues. And I would actually throw that question out to the group. And, and what is the role of religion in our society? Um, and it's fascinating. It's, it's, a, it's a conversation. It's a question that we're asking ourselves as, as Jews. Uh, but it's, it's even a question that the evangelical movement is asking themselves. One of the things that the debate that's going on in the evangelical um, movement is, you know, is do we want to just be about um, oppo opposing abortion or taking right-wing politics, or do we want to embrace um, stewardship of the earth and get involved in protecting the environment? And they're, they're well, you know, what, is it about is it about the next world or is it about this world? And they're really engaging in that conversation. And I would say that that's a question that a dynamic, vibrant religion is asking itself: How can I relate to people's life? in the world that we're living in. And certainly as social workers, and I think the majority of you are here, um, you can ask that question of a client. You're not bound to a particular religious tradition. You can say to a client, and p people can change religions. And perhaps one of the responses to therapy, uh, and now of course I don't want them to leave my religion, but you know, but honestly, <laughs> one of the, <laughs> but one of the responses to therapy, or one of the, I think the in challenges of therapy can be, um, maybe you're in the wrong religious tradition. Maybe you need to ask yourself if there's another religious tradition which can give you strength and support and reinforce your sense of who you are and be therapeutic for you in, in, in your life. That's the wonder of America on some levels. I'm seeing, I'm just going to hold the question for one second. I'm seeing that we have five minutes left and the question had been raised about what an, an, an interfaith group would look like. And uh, since it's obviously something that we're quite interested in pursuing, um, some of the foundational issues you know, that we considered in terms of creating the round table would be at play with an interfaith group. That it would have to be people who were willing to be learners, who were not judgmental, who were open to diversity of thought and belief, and wanting to, you know, to get the, have the capacity both to engage and to engage in a respectful way, you know, with people who might have very different worldviews. Uh, I mean, as social workers and rabbis did at the beginning of this. I mean, we had really different sure. worldviews. Um, and to, to see, you know, to find the common ground in terms of the, both personal yeah. growth. Bless you. Again, we haven't even talked about countertransference, but let's just assume everybody knows that, I mean, countertransference is a big part of this. People willing, you know, to, to, to risk being able to talk about, you know, how they react to certain situations and how they might learn from each other and, and, and be more reflective, you know, about what their experience in, either as a clinician or as a pastoral counselor is. Th their faith traditions 
and observances and rituals and prayers in ways that were appropriate, you know, which meant that they waited to hear, to listen. They listened to the issues people were bringing. Um, you know, what, what was going to be appropriate? Was there something appropriate from the faith tradition? And if so, I mean, they talked about how they picked and chose what they did. Um, what what they picked and chose was very different. Their theologies were very different, but that that was not a problem in terms of learning from each other in terms of their pastoral approaches. There, there was, like, I mean, enormous similarities between them. Um, and I think that was like my, my first sort of prod to start thinking about, you know, it's been wonderful doing this within the Jewish community, but it really doesn't have to be limited to that. We, we just have so much to learn from each other. You had a question before. Well, I mean, I don't know. This, is, this, is a, this is a famous story from the Talmud of the, the person who asked the rabbi to explain all the Torah while he's standing on one foot. You know, I don't know how I can answer that right with, with the, the, the two minutes that are left. I think it's part of a much larger conversation. I think a person, a cha family has to be challenged. Um, and this is, look, it doesn't matter what your socioeconomic status is for this challenge. And that is, where does your happiness come from? And where does your fulfillment come from? And I have, I've seen many families who have everything, and I see, I see, they may not know it, but I see them as the most spiritually empty people I've ever met. And they may have the largest house I've ever been in, and I feel sorry for them. And I've seen people, and this is not, I, mean this, I know this is, it sounds hyperbolic, but it's not. You know, this is the, this is the real life. It's, it's for a family to look inward. Uh, I happen to have a very close relationship with Father Scott Santa Rosa over Dolores Mission. And Scott ministers to one of the poorest congregations in the city, it's in Boyle Heights. And the fulfillment that his folks find in the community that's brought together around this wonderful church that he's created and, and caring for each other and the school that they, that they have a Catholic school there as well. Um, and I don't think there's one family that pays full tuition at the school. But they found this sense of community and this sense of belonging and this sense of purpose. And here, our congregation on the west side is saying to this congregation in Boyle Heights, we want to be your partners in rebuilding Los Angeles. So poverty doesn't matter anymore. And it, it's really about finding purpose in life that I think, now, that doesn't help you if you don't have health care and you can't eat, right? That's not going to solve that problem. On the other hand, it can at least the last thing I would want someone to walk out of my office thinking or out of an encounter with me thinking is that somehow or another that's God's decision for them. That their plight is what God has in the cards for them. Because then I would say, if that's the case, then are you telling me that the wealthy person is favored by God? And that's, I find that equally offensive, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm projecting theology onto all of you. Sorry about that. But, but, that's, but, that, but you asked a question, so I would have to give my honest response to that. So... I, I just want to say one last piece, um, and then I guess you'll close, but the, the, the interfaith experience for me, and I talked about Father Scott, um, has been so fulfilling. And what, what, whether it's Father Scott or Pastor Ryan Bell or Carlton Roden at American Baptist Church, is that what, what these pastors bring to our encounter and what we all bring to our clergy caucus is there is absolutely no desire to transform anyone else into our model of religion. It's the opposite. It's what can you bring to my own spiritual experience because of your, your faith tradition? And when, a pray, when, when Father Scott offers a prayer or, or Carlton offers a prayer, um, what happens is I go back to my prayers thinking differently about them or when I bring a text. And so the interfaith encounter 
is, and this is really, a, we have to recognize this is a product of the modern world that is, is really exceptional. That religious traditions can sit down with each other and their agenda is not to convert each other, but they can appreciate each other's differences. Now, there are some pastors who can't do that. There are some rabbis who can't do that. They're not the people for the interfaith gathering. That's for sure. But the ones who can walk out of that session inspired and uplifted. And my only wish is that I can share it with more of my congregants so they can have the same experience that I do. So I would encourage you, if you can engage people in interfaith dialogue like this and you can be a part of that, recognize the transformation you can bring to your pastor's lives as well as the social workers. So I, I reference that you have the article about the round table and there's a lot more information in it um, than we were able to cover in our time today. But first of all, I really appreciated your questions mm -hmm. because I think that, that any presentation like this is really about the questions. Um, and the questions illuminate our understanding as well. So thank you very much for coming. And <laughs>